We will continue our journey through the wonderful book of First Timothy. We will be studying chapter 2 tonight, First Timothy chapter 2, which has uh, 15 verses. Chapter 2, 1 Timothy, verse 1. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men for all men. This is an admonition, an exhortation to pray for all men. We need to pray for each other as a fellowship, as members of the body of Christ Jesus. But moreover, we should also pray for all Man, that's the revelation here. Don't be selfish in your prayers. Your prayers shouldn't be only for your friends, your families, your siblings, your kids, your parents. We should pray for everybody. And do you know the reason why we should pray or we must pray for everybody? so that God can also give them the gift of repentance. We are here tonight, gathered here tonight, fellowshipping with this wonderful book of 1 Timothy chapter 2, because God grant us, granted us the wonderful gift of repentance. Not only should, should we be praying for all men, but verse 2 goes even further. For kings and for all that are in authority. And this is one verse neglected by Christians. We very much apply many verses which is good in the word of God but this is one type of verses neglected in the word of God in, neglected by, uh, by uh, Christians this is a commandment not only should we be praying for all men but verse 2 says for kings and for all that are in authority governors, the president, judges, legislators, we should pray for them. And what is the reason given here? The reason is that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. We should pray. Pray for the Supreme Court, the tribunals. Pray for the, uh, the mayor of our city, the city council members. There is a verse in the Bible saying, the heart of the king of the heart of the authority is inside God's hand. So he, God can lead the king's heart or the authority heart whatever he pleases, whatever God pleases. So this is a good commandment here 
in our prayer, be it privately, individually, be it in a fellowship as we're doing right now, we should pray for kings, meaning people in power. We should pray for them. And mocking an authority or president is not a good thing. It's not suitable for Christians. For Christians, We should obey, not only obey the authority, we should treat them with respect in our discourse. We should respect them. Making fun of a king, of a president, of a judge, of an authority is not suitable for Christians. This is suitable for non-believers, for pagan. But for Christians, not only are we to pray for the kings, presidents, princes, authorities, we should also hold them in respect. Avoid, avoid mocking them. Avoid making fun of them. We can see uh, over, inter- over the internet or in social medias memes about rulers, the presidents, judges. This is not suitable for Christians. A Christian, uh, a Christian, sorry, a Christian is to respect the the authorities because the Bible says any authority you can see comes from God. And sometimes you can wonder why is that this authority is coming from God but is condoning condoning homosexuality, for instance, or transgenderism or abortion. Let me tell you something. Sometimes, as we see in the Bible, mostly throughout the, throughout the Old Testament, God sent authorities to punish is people. The same thing can happen today. When a nation departs from God, when a nation abandons God, abandons God, God can punish them by sending authorities, presidents, rulers, judges who will be making their lives miserable, miserable. That's why we should pray for our rulers. Those are the foundation of the Christian life. Foundation. And we must repent for any mockery, we made of authorities any meme we laughed at regarding an authority, any fun we made of an authority, we have to repent, ask God for forgiveness. Those are very simple things, but Believe me, they can have serious consequences in our lives. In our lives. You want to be blessed by God? You want to be blessed by God? You want to have a joyful life? 
a peaceful life, put this verse into practice. Again, verse 2, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead, lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. Mocking, mocking a king, mocking a president, even that, even if, even if that president is not worthy of your respect, because the way uh, he be, he behaves, because of his of his evil decisions, we still are to respect the authority, and moreover to pray for them. So for kings and for all that are in authority. And again, I am emphasizing the reason why God admonishes us to pray for them, for the kings, for presidents, for rulers, for princes, so that we can have a peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. Honesty. Verse 3, for this is good. This is what? Good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. That's the will of God. This, the will of God is that every person on earth be saved, be saved. Even the most despicable person is to be saved. Jesus Christ died on the cross, the Holy Cross, for all people on earth. And verse 4 goes deeper by giving us the reason why we should pray for all men. And we have it here. God wants all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Unto the knowledge of the truth. How can people come to the knowledge of the truth if they are no preachers? How, come, how can people come to the knowledge of the truth if there are no people bold or valiant to go out there and to tell the truth. Our mission for those serving the Lord Jesus Christ, our mission should be to go out there to preach the truth so that people can hear the truth, to preach salvation from, from sin, deliverance from sin, so that all people can be saved, can be saved. Verse 5, for there is how many gods? How many gods? 5, 2, 11, a million in India. How many? Only one. Our Lord and our God and Father, only one, the Almighty God, only one. So there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, the man, Christ Jesus. This is not a good verse that helps us Difference, different, different to make the, dif the difference between Jesus Christ and God. They are distinct from each other. They are separate, just like Steve, Stephen, this wonderful disciple of Jesus Christ, named uh, Stephen. So in Acts chapter. Uh, 
6 and 7. Jesus Christ is not at the same time his father and his son. Don't think if uh, by the grace of God you go into paradise, you go into heaven, you're going to see a person, allow me that expression, you're going to see a person in front of you who is at the same time Jesus, who is at the same time God, and who is at the same time the Holy Spirit. No. That couldn't be so. Stephen, the day he was stoned to death, saw Jesus Christ standing at the right hand of God in the heaven. If you believe Jesus has been the same at the same time his father and his son, you are believing in a demon, in a demonic entity. Our God is distinct from his son. Jesus Christ is not God the Father. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. This is very important to, to, to know. There are false doctrines teaching that Jesus is at the same time his own Father and his own Son. This is not a sound biblical doctrine. We should differentiate between God and between His Son, Jesus Christ. So this is a good verse, verse 5 again. For there is one God and one mediator. Mediator. What's the meaning of mediator? Think of a lawyer in a court. Can a judge be at the same time a judge and a lawyer? There is no way. You have a judge and you have either a lawyer. And by the way, there is a verse saying that Jesus is also our lawyer. And now we see that Jesus is our mediator. Meaning the, a person pleading our cause in front of an authority, in front of a judge. And the supreme judge is our God. So people professing that false, that, that false doctrine according to which Jesus Christ is at the same time his father and his uh, uh, son, they negate, they negate or deny this great revelation. The revelation stating that, stating that Jesus is our mediator. So we have one God, the Father, the Almighty God, and one mediator between God. Look, between God and man. Between God and man. So you have God, you have man, and in the middle, who do you have? Jesus Christ, the mediator. It couldn't be more simple than that. Somebody has to have a mind blindfolded by the devil to not understand these simple truths. These simple truths. We have God, we have man, and between God and man, we have a mediator, Jesus Christ. Pleading the cause of man in front of his father. In the sitting. In the sitting. This is a great verse. That's why Bible stories like this are very important. Highly important. We learned something wonderful tonight, right? That 
between God and Jesus Christ. No, no, between God and man. In the middle, we have a mediator. Jesus Christ. The man, Christ Jesus, a man. He was born as a man, died for, for us on the cross, rose from the dead, from the dead, and ascended in heaven, where he's acting as our lawyer, our intercessor, intercessor, or intercessor, or our mediator. Again, verse 5, before we move on. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Verse 6, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. What's the meaning of a ransom? Let's say a uh, a bandit or gangster goes and kidnap the son of a famous a wealthy person. The bandit going to re require the kidnapper. The gangster going to require a ransom for the release of the son kidnapped. It's a ransom. So Jesus Christ paid that ransom for us by, by dying in, on the, uh, the cross in Golgotha. He paid that ransom freely. Gave himself, himself he, uh, verse 6 again, sorry, who gave himself a ransom for all. To be testified in due time. And tonight, we're still testifying that Jesus Christ gave himself as a ransom. We were worthy of death. We were worthy of eternal fire. Eternal fire in hell. We were worthy of that. But because of Jesus Christ, because of his death on the cross in Golgotha more than 2,000 year, years ago, he paid the ransom. So we're no longer under the wrath of God, under the wrath of God. Verse 7, whereunto, whereunto, am um, ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Verity is a fancy word for truth. It comes from French verity. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Verity. I in truth. Verse, verse 8, verse 8, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up what? Their hands. Do you read their hands? No. And most Christians nowadays, nowadays pray with their hands, figuratively, figuratively. Dirty hands, hands of sin, lying, stealing, sexual immorality. Committing fraud, adultery, divorcing, disobedience to parent to parents. But they are every Sunday in so-called house houses of of worship that are nothing but houses of whoredom, 
of prostitutions, habitation of demons. A true Christian, a true disciple of Jesus Christ, must lift up unto God holy hands. Holy hands, the expression holy hands here is an image of godliness, an image of sanctification. Holy hand without wrath and doubting. We have another revelation here. When you lift up your hand, your hands unto God, first, the hands must be holy. Second, you shouldn't be doubting. Because the Bible says, people who doubt they not agree, they, they, they not approved of God. They not approved of God. There is a verse, let me read that verse with you. Just a, pare, uh, uh, a parenthesis, uh, uh, let's open a paren uh, parenthesis, a parenthesis here. Let's make, a, let's, let's make a, di a digression in the, uh, Hebrew chapter 11, a verse that amplifies what we're reading here in First Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. I'm trying to explain and amplify doubting. Many people pray and their prayers are not answered because they doubt. They lack faith. They lack faith when they pray. When you pray, God, first, you lift up holy hands. Second, there is no wrath in your heart. Third, you doubt not. You doubt not. So, Hebrew chapter 11, verse 6. What do we read? We read that, again, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, without faith, it is impossible to please him, meaning God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And doubting is a manifestation of the lack of faith. Doubting is a manifestation of a lack of faith. So when we pray, let, 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 let me summarize verse 8, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. I will therefore, one, I, I will therefore, sorry, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, meaning without ceasing, everywhere, lifting up holy hands, without wrath and doubting. If you doubt, your, ans your prayers won't be answered because you're doubting. Now, we're going to end this chapter and the teaching tonight by admonitions specifically addressed addressed to women in Christ. Those are strong admonitions for women as disciples of Jesus Christ. Verse 9, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shame Facetness, shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or, or gold or pearls or costly array, 
verse 10, but which becometh or becomes women professing godliness with good works. Many pastors and many churches totally disregard this wonderful commandment in verse 9. Nowadays, in Christian circles, you see women dressed like whores, like prostitutes, naked. A woman that fear God, a godly woman, a woman fearing God, should not be dressing like the world. Exhibiting your private parts. We have come to a generation where if people in Sodom and Gomorrah were to come back for, uh, from the dead, they would be shocked of what you, we sing right now. Make a short trip to Walmart. Go to parks. You're going to see people, women dressed like prostitutes. And it's not only Walmarts or public parks or spring break beaches in Florida. But this happens in churches on Sunday. You see women dressed like they are in nightclubs. That's why I call those churches houses of prostitutions. Houses of whoredom, habitation of demons. God is not there. God is holy, 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 holy. Billions and billions and billions and billions of time holy. Holiness is the nature of God. And if we we are worshiping that God, the only God, the God who is holy, the one God, the almighty, almighty God, you should go to that God with the utmost holiness. The way you dress should set you apart, should set you apart. Look at Muslim uh, Muslim women. They don't. They don't. Do, they don't know the truth, because the truth is only available through Jesus Christ. But look at how Muslim women dress. Look at how they dress. But nowadays, in so-called so-called churches, in so-called Christian circles. You have women dressing like prostitutes. Their legs, every, uh, all the private parts of their body are exposed. That shouldn't be so. Verse 9 again, in like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness, shamefacedness, and sobriety, sobriety. Being drunk is not appropriate for a man. Even so, for a woman, sobriety. You're not drunk, you're not high on drugs. Sobriety, the way you act, the way you speak, your attitude in public, young Christian women should be distinguished. Your attitude should be with 
oh, you should be with poise, distinguished. Verse 9 again, in like manner also, that women adorn, adorn themselves with what? Extravagant apparel. That's what you read here. No, not extravagant, but modest. Modesty is what pleases God. Girls, young women, do you want to please God? Adopt modesty as a lifestyle. Adopt modesty as a lifestyle. Not with broidered hair. What's the meaning of broidered hair? Any types of widgets you add to your hair to make it look fancy. Your hair should be natural. Chemical products to uh, strengthen your hair or to uh, make it look beautiful so that people can admire you, admire you on, on TikTok or in the street. We should seek to please only God and not men. So, not with broidered gold, uh, not, not with broidered hair or gold or pearl, pearls or costly array. Everything costly. Modesty again, let me rephrase it. Modesty should be or must be the lifestyle of a young woman who fears God. Godliness equates modesty. For those of you of for those of you taking notes, let me say it again. Godliness equates Modesty. Modesty. Verse 10, but which becometh or becomes, to put it simply, women professing godliness with good works. Verse 11 is a controversial subject in Christianity today. Let the woman learn in what? Gabi Gassim? No. Oh, in silence. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. Subjection. And as we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, going back, just for a little digression, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 34, let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience as also says the law. Now, you have women pastors. And they have the Jezebel spirit revealed by the Lord Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 2, verse 20. Again, verse 34, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 14, uh, 14, verse 34. Let your women keep, how? Silence. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for is, it is not permitted. And this is God speaking to us through Apostle Paul. It's not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience as also saith 
or says the law, to put it simply. Nowadays, you have women pastors. You have women apostles. And even worse, you have lesbian who are pastors. You have gay people, a man married to a man, but they both serve as, as, pastor, as pastors. As I was teaching yesterday, we live in the real dark ages. Not the dark ages of the uh, medieval era, but we, we live in the real, the real dark ages. And those dark ages we're living in couldn't be darker. A woman who speaks in a Christian church, a real Christian church, a biblical Christian church, is an abomination in the eyes of God. A woman shouldn't be teaching. A woman shouldn't be pastor or teaching or speaking. Verse 9, rather verse 11, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. Verse 12, but I suffer not a woman to teach. See? Who is lying here? Not my God and Father. He's not a liar. You see, churches all over the world, all over here in America, allowing women to teach. And the Bible says here, I suffer not a woman to teach. To teach. To teach. So, if you see a woman teaching the word of God, that means she's doing the will of who? The will of uh, the person who inspired the verse we inspired the verses we the verse we are reading right now, or the enemy of the person who inspired the verse. The enemy, the devil. So a woman who teaches is inspired by the spirit of the devil, the spirit of Satan. You shouldn't be even, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be listening even one second to a woman who teaches. Because listening to a woman who is teaching the word of God is, you, you're sinning. Because the, the, Bible, the Bible says here what, I suffer not a woman to teach. And that's not all. The verse goes on by saying, nor to usurp. You see, underline the usurp. Usurp is taking something that doesn't belong to you. That's the meaning of usurp, usurpation. Like somebody who is not a police officer, he buys police uniform in Amazon or eBay and he starts chasing drivers on I-45. He's usurping. You want to be a police officer? Go to the police academy to suffer the stringent training over there for six months, one year, two years. Then you're going to be an officer. So somebody is not a police officer or somebody is not a judge and he goes on Amazon or eBay buy a black robe, a black judge robe, and enters the courtroom and with uh, the gavel and starts to bend the gavel on the table. All right, I'm the judge. He's going to be arrested. He's going to be thrown in jail. Because of what? He's usurping the title of the church. But what about usurping a godly ministry? If a man is punished because he's usurping the authority 
of a judge, of a police officer or magistrate. But what about, what punishment do you think a woman who is usurping the godly authority of a minister or a preacher would receive? What do you think, what kind of punishment do you think that woman should, would, 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 will receive? God is really merciful. God is really merciful. So all those women, George Mayer, Paula White, and so forth, they are usurping the authorities. Rather the authority, excuse me, the authority, they are usurping. Let the woman, verse 11 again, let the woman learn in silence, silence with all, with all, all subjection. Not subjection only, but all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over, over the men, but to be in silence. Don't you see that this verse is in alignment with 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 34, we just read? In silence! And God goes on by giving us the reason why. The reason is in the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden. Verse 13, for Adam, Adam was first formed, then Eve. Verse 14, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if she continue, if she, if they, sorry, if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Again, holiness. God expects holiness for all disciples, men or women, but especially for women. The standard of holiness of women in the eyes of God is higher than that of men. That of men. When we read this chapter, and principally uh, the last verse of the chapter, What observation can we, can we make? We can make the observation that everything we see right now in so-called churches, amongst so-called Christians, has nothing to do with the Word of God. That's why we should go back To the foundations. The Bible gives us the foundation of sound doctrine. I hope you're going to be blessed, uh, blessed by uh, these revelations and that as young men and mostly as young women, you're going to rise to the standard of holiness Sobriety, God, God expects of women who fear Him. Let's, let's pray and give thanks to God for these revelations. Our dear Almighty God, thank you for this revelation, for reminding us the standard of uh, holiness you want us to aspire to. Thank you for our hearts. Thank you for giving us the, the burning passion to learn more and more and the, the burning passion to put your word into practice as we see our lives being transformed by thy word. 
Thank you for everything we learned today. Thank you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we prayed. Amen.